Uh, I would like to warmly welcome you to day three of our amazing conference. Um, I hope those of you who were out last night are ready to be woken up by Mark and his keynote. Uh, we have this wonderful plenary for you this morning. Uh, Mark Andreevich is going to give a talk called Seeing Like a Border, Securing Circulation During COVID and Beyond. And for those of you who don't know Mark, which I imagine is not very many of you, um, Mark is a highly prolific researcher um, and a fabulous theoretician in the field of surveillance and digital media. He has written on monitoring, on data mining. He is skilled in qualitative and quantitative methods, which gives him an edge over a lot of us who have only ambitions in that direction. And for particular interest of those in the catch network, he has written about sorting in the online economy and thinking how people are categorized, which is particularly relevant to ADM discussions that we've been having over the past couple of days. So we have 90 minutes to get into day three. Mark is gonna go first and he will be followed by our fabulous panel, who you already know. Um, but I perhaps will remind them to introduce themselves when they start talking in response and situate themselves and their expertise relative to Mark. So I hand over to Mark for this first keynote of day three. Thank you, Thank Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do I have slide controls? A clicker here. Hmm. Sorry. Uh, well, while I'm looking for a clicker, I just um, I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference um, uh, and especially Hai Ching for uh, inviting me and, and bringing me in. Um, uh, oh, thanks so much. Uh, and also a uh, huge thanks to those uh, who supported and made possible this, uh, this event, including the ARC Center for Automated Decision Making and Society. Uh, I'd also like to apologize for missing the first couple of days. I, I had some previous commitments that brought me out of town, but I was looking at the schedule and it looked so interesting. And so I'm looking very much forward to catching up with everybody and to following um, all of today's events as well. So thank you so much. Um, the, uh, the presentation that I'm gonna talk about now really has to do with rethinking the way in which we might talk about or understand logics of surveillance against the background of emerging biometric technologies. Uh, and so I, there will be a kind of tangential connection to the Chinese context, but I'm hoping that some of the discussion um, uh, might provide fruitful grounds for thinking about some more connections uh, to the work that's going on in China, and in particular around the technologies that I'm gonna be talking about. The um, work that I'm gonna present I, I'm, I'm going to try to make a, a kind of <clears throat> uh, come up with a theoretical frame for thinking about the impact of um, real-time mass individualized identification uh, and what that means for how we think about the functioning of forms of governance, control, and social sorting that take place via biometric technologies. Um, and I'm going to do that against the background of work that I've been doing uh, with an ARC-funded research team, one of the members who's, uh, of which is here, uh, Chris O'Neill. That team also includes, uh, oh, sorry, two, <laughs> sorry, Shin, Chris O'Neill and Shin Gu uh, are both on this team. Uh, and Shin will be presenting also a little bit later um, some related work uh, to the, what we've been doing on facial recognition technology. Um, uh, Neil Selwyn at Monash is also on that team and Gavin Smith. Uh, and so it's, it's gonna be focused on facial recognition technology but I, there may be some ways in which um, the types of claims I'm making might generalize to other forms of biometric monitoring and other forms of real-time mass personalized identification. So I'm gonna start with this example. Um, maybe some of you have seen this. It intrigued me um, because it's, it specified some of the ways in which um, uh, individualized, a, a kind of real-time identification can be used for social sorting. I don't know if anybody saw this, but um, in New York City, <clears throat> the uh, uh, event venue owner, uh, MSG, which owns Madison Square Garden, also owns Radio City Music Hall, two iconic venues in New York City, um, had actually created a face recognition database of all of the employees of law firms that were engaged in litigation against their company, which is presumably 
quite a few people. Um, but uh, what they did was they were using that, auto, that face recognition database to exclude people from their venues. So an employee of one of these law firms brought her daughter to see the Rockettes during the holiday season in New York City at Radio City Music Hall, which is a holiday tradition. Uh, and she was identified by face recognition technology, pulled out of the crowd and told that she was uh, not going to be permitted to uh, attend the event uh, because of this blanket ban. Um, What's intriguing to me about that is the uh, automated specified recognition and the way it can be used for forms of social sorting. In this case, it's also obviously a kind of punitive use of the technology uh, by a company that wants to create inconvenience for those uh, with whom it remains in some form of dispute. Um, so that model of a world in which wherever we go, uh, our, our individual identity can be recognized and that can be used to uh, sort uh, and control the way we move and also the informational environment around us. That to me seems suggestive and I wanna um, think a little bit about the impact of that. When I talk about seeing like a border, um, it, I, I guess what, what I'm really trying to think about is what happens when borders can see in automated ways. Uh, and when I say borders, I'm, I'm thinking not just of national borders, although obviously that is one of the places where face recognition technology plays a big role, but I'm thinking of multiplying forms of checkpoints and boundaries um, and access points that have been associated with, uh, in part, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, about which I'll say a little bit more. Uh, and the claims that I want to make about these kind of recognitive borders is that they enable um, cascading logics of automation which reach into physical space. This seems to me to be perhaps uh, one of the interesting developments, and it's not entirely new, but I think it's facilitated by the increasing ubiquity of face recognition technology. Um, so it's not just identification. It's not, it's not just monitoring the way CCTV cameras might do. It's not just identification the way smart cameras might do, but it's the link between smart cameras and smart spaces that can do sorting in real time. And then the example of Radio City Music Hall, um, it required human intervention, right? There was an automated notification. Somebody had to come and pull this person out of the crowd. There are technologies that are emerging that are actually going to control access points and checkpoints so that the so that the channeling, the canalization of circulation becomes automated, so that physical space deforms in real time in response to individuals uh, and informational space as well. And I'll say a few more things about that. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to try to think about that through forms of governance that operate through the milieu, right? and this is a kind of Foucauldian reference. What does it mean to govern by changing the milieu in real time in response to identified individuals? How does that uh, uh, transform logics of governance or the way we think about those logics? Uh, I Obviously, COVID-19 is an interesting place to look at the way in which biometrics were used to control access and channel uh, movement and securitized circulation. Um, <clears throat> uh, the work that we did uh, in the first couple of years of this project on face recognition technology took place against the background of the pandemic. So what we did was we went to a bunch of security trade shows virtually because we were not unable to travel at that time and looked at the ways in which these trade shows and security organizations were uh, deploying the technologies that they had in response to the pandemic. We didn't start out thinking about the response to the pandemic, but we were kind of forced into that position by what was happening in the world. Uh, and what we found was th that these companies were repurposing the technology quite quickly to respond to the need to securitize circulation in the face of viral contagion. Um, so obviously the, um, uh, the health code system uh, in China was uh, a, a system uh, again, many of you know more about this than I do, but I, I wanted to make the link uh, that used networked portable uh, individual personal devices to be able to sort uh, circulation and access in real time. Um, I'm, I was interested in this uh, phrase, company of time and space, which was used to articulate uh, the fact that you may have been exposed to somebody who uh, had been diagnosed positive with COVID. Do you occupy time and space at the same time as they did? That could be uh, um, 
derived from obviously your device information and then of course the assumption that the device is linked to you as a person uh, the one of the things that biometrics does is attempt to address any possible slippage between your device and your body uh, and i'll say more about that in a second but i'll also give a few examples of some of the ways in which the, the companies that are developing face recognition technology were deploying it in response to the need to securitize circulation during the, the pandemic. Uh, and so there were companies like uh, NEC, one of the big players in face recognition technology, that was finding ways to uh, connect remote biometric forms of monitoring that could discern symptoms such as um, surface body temperature and link that to identity using uh, smart cameras that could uh, identify people's faces. So um, what you could do was in real time, uh, identify those people who might be manifesting symptoms and then uh, intervene in some way, deny access, pull them out of the crowd as they did in Hawaiian airports, um, find ways to filter the flow and the movement of individuals in real time, time based on the data that you could collect. The other thing that was kind of interesting that was taking place that I'll talk to talk about a little bit um, a little bit later was the promise of touchlessness. Um, if you remember early on during the pandemic, there was um, some uh, speculation as to how what the vectors of contagion were. And there was concern that I think the fomites, you know, things that people who were infected and touched, if you touch them, you could also um, uh, uh, potentially come down with COVID. Uh, so touchlessness became an imperative. We know this, right? You know, wear gloves, disinfect everything. Um, I, I, I saw in the supermarket the other day, a special key made out of brass that you could use so that you didn't have to touch doorknobs. It was like a key shaped thing. You could hook it on handles. You could use it to turn doorknobs. So don't touch things. Face recognition technology became an access control point technology that was um, against the background of the concern about the pandemic, beneficial because it was touchless. So there were a number of entities that changed uh, forms of, for example, these were secure locations, fingerprint access, uh, card swipe with face recognition technology so you didn't have to touch anything. Uh, and touchlessness has something interesting to say, I think about, the, uh, I, I, I mean, this is a bigger conversation, so it's slight tangent, but about the fate of the social, which I'll return to in the closing remarks, but this notion that um, all interactions are a form of risk, and one way you can minimize it is through contactlessness. Um, so uh, the other feature, of course, of the pandemic that this technology was used for was to monitor access points for mass transit, for buildings, for residential complexes, for offices. Um, how can you erect all of a sudden uh, a whole new set of boundaries that have to be cleared in order to securitize the forms of circulation uh, that move through shared space. Um, and I, I think there's, I, I, you know, it's, I guess it's because of the work that I've done on digital media technologies, there's a real kind of online analog to this. We can see, if you remember back to the earlier days of the World Wide Web, there was a kind of borderlessness to it, right? As you moved <clears throat> from page to page, from site to site, there weren't the type of access and control points uh, and password logins that we have now. As the space became more commercialized, as the commercial model based on um, <clears throat> data capture and customization emerged, uh, the incentive to erect forms of digital barriers and boundaries and checkpoints increased. And now we're used to a kind of online space that's highly um, embordered. Uh, and one of the things that facial recognition technology and other forms of biometric, remote biometrics make possible is a kind of virtual embordering of physical space that would have an analog, I think, to, to the digital realm. Um, during the pandemic, of course, we saw uh, borders multiplying. Taken to the limit, I think of this as a kind of thickening of borders or an expansion of borders to fill the space. So the border no longer becomes um, uh, you know, a line that you cross and you're either on the inside or the outside. Uh, but uh, sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. It's not that it's not that discrete moment of crossing. It's once you enter into a monitored space, you've entered into one in which identification and whatever other forms of inference can be made about you operate continuously. So that it's not a discrete passage, but it's an entry into an embordered space, if you might think of it as that uh, in, in those terms. Um, when that happens, uh, so, for example, think of spaces that are policed for symptoms. Um, 
uh, and that's linked to your identity. Uh, when that happens, if remote biometrics can be used to identify you, then you're carrying basically the border on your body. At any given point, um, the border might intervene. Uh, sorry, you've got a symptom, you need to be excluded. Uh, this, this was kind of literalized in some ways um, uh, by those in the US who wanted to take Clearview AI. You probably know this, this is a face recognition app claimed to be quite powerful that has the largest database of scraped images from the internet. Um, uh, there were some, um, you know, conservative uh, anti-immigration or immigration control folks in the U.S. who wanted to create a database of undocumented folks that could be put on an app so that anyone who had access to that app could just wander around a city uh, or wherever they were, run faces and see if those people were on the undocumented list. So basically bring the border to the, the entire space. Uh, so... <clears throat> um, what what I want to I, I want to think about I, I'm going to give some examples of the customization of physical space in real time, and then I'm going to make a couple of suggestions, kind of theoretical suggestions about how we might approach this. This was an interesting one to me that I came across when we were doing the research um, at the trade shows. It's the development of uh, of elevators that use face recognition technology to become buttonless, right? So the, the elevator knows who you are and what floor you can go to. Your ability to select your movement through space is transferred from, uh, from the interface that you have with the elevator. I'll press this button. No, I'll press this button. I'll press them all and go for a ride to the elevator itself, which knows who you are and sends you to the designated floor uh, that you are assigned. Uh, I, obviously, there might be some issues with that if you need to move from floor to floor. But um, but you get the, the get, get the general idea. If you live in an apartment complex, it knows which floor you live on. You just walk in, the elevator takes you to that floor. This was really interesting to me. Uh, this was some of the one of the um, analysts who's talking about this technology. If you're a very important person, we can invoke a VIP service, which would drop everybody off on the ride, come to your floor, pick only you up and not pick anyone else up along the way and take you directly to your office or suite. That's a really interesting kind of tiering of physical space, right? Um, you know, it, we, we can think of analogs, right? Like express lanes on freeways and so on. But this idea that recognition could be used to rearrange physical space so that VIPs would bounce everybody else up off the, off the elevator and have their own, uh, their own, you know, rapid passage. Um, so uh, that raises maybe some implications for, uh, um, how some of the ways in which this technology may be used for social sorting. When it comes to COVID-19, some of the examples that we came across when we were at the trade shows, uh, and you've probably seen some of this in the media coverage, the use of facial technology spanned a whole range of forms of control that all had uh, elements of um, securitizing circulation and enforcing boundaries and sorting uh, movement. Uh, so for enforcing quarantine restrictions, you may have read about places, uh, I think Moscow had this in place, if you were on a um, if you were on quarantine, your face was entered into a database. That database was linked to smart cameras throughout the city. And if you moved beyond the space you were designated, you could be detected. Here in Australia, of course, the face recognition was used to enforce home quarantine in some states, uh, including South Australia, uh, rather than doing in, uh, um, you know, uh, in hotel quarantine, you could be home quarantined, but you'd have to be subject to random phone calls, at which point you'd scan your face. That would be linked to the geolocation data of your phone, and that would uh, indicate where you were. Um, scanning for symptoms, uh, contact tracing, um, <clears throat> Uh, and enforcing social distancing and mask wearing. So there were companies that were developing technologies that could do things like count how many people were in the room, uh, identify those people, see whether they were um, following uh, social distancing guidelines. If one of them uh, came down with uh, COVID, you could see who they were in proximity to and uh, provide alerts to those people. Um, so uh, in, in a sense, COVID becomes a model for thinking about the securitization of circulation more generally. And um, uh, one of the reasons that, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Foucault, one of the reasons that I think Foucault's analysis, it might be useful for thinking about some of these developments here is because he's often thinking about um, securitizing circulation through the lens of pandemics, epidemics, contagion. Uh, um, but I, I guess the claim that I'm trying to make is it might be interesting to think about the fact that these technologies were already geared up before the 
pandemic came, they're likely to outlast the pandemic, assuming the pandemic ends at some point. Uh, and um, the types of applications uh, that uh, they can lend themselves to, I think it's probably a good time now to consider what the logics down the road are. These are a couple of findings from the trade show work that we did when we uh, uh, were trying to identify some of the ways in which the technology was being framed for those who would consume it. And the, this logic is pretty familiar. It's that of convenience, the tyranny of convenience that structures um, the surveillance model in the online world. Um, I, I suppose just, just as, a, sorry, a quick aside, you, you may have seen some of this coverage. As the borders in the online world proliferate, uh, you know, we live in a world now where um, those who have kind of all, always on access to the internet tend to have on the order of something like 100 passwords or more for various things that they're logging into. One of the solutions that's proposed for managing that wealth of passwords is biometric, right? Um, fingerprint, face recognition technology, you'd have one ID, you didn't, don't have to worry about um, uh, storing your password somewhere or um, remembering them and so on. Um, so uh, that promise of frictionlessness, whether in virtual space or physical space, is one of the frames that's used to mobilize the promise of convenience of the technology. And it's worth locating that within a kind of dialectical logic of um, make the borders proliferate, that creates a problem of friction, offer a solution of frictionlessness, uh, frame through the, um, your identity being linked to your body in ways that can be identified passively at a distance. Uh, so it's pretty difficult to argue against the proposition that convenience is gonna be the driving factor, right? That's the online model. Um, typically it's convenience and security, right? Those are, the, those are gonna be the drivers. Um, friction has become the new F word. This is from one of the, um, uh, you know, marketers at, at, uh, of this technology. As a smooth user experience has taken priority, bringing with it better customer and employee satisfaction, touchlessness as a new imperative. Like touchlessness and frictionless go hand in hand. Touchlessness seems to be interesting, is, is an interesting one because of, of what it says about the perils of contact, I think. Um, the other one obviously related is, what, is what's described as operational tempo. Um, we've seen over the past several years a stronger and stronger adoption of, you know, how do I do things faster? How do I do things with less contact? Um, those, those, are, those two things obviously are related to less, less contact and faster. Um, and so where we're likely to see promises of inconvenience have to do with things like um, uh, checking at hotels, uh, uh, monitoring stadium lines, um, of course, airport uh, and border control, all of the places where there are some choke points uh, of friction, face recognition is going to intervene uh, as, a, as a promise of convenience or may. Uh, that, I mean, that would be a kind of prediction. Um, uh, most of the literature on face recognition technology from a critical perspective, or much of it, has focused on <clears throat> uh, issues of bias and, of course, you know, questions of privacy and in intrusiveness. Um, I, I want to spend some time thinking about strategies of control and governance, uh, and I, I, I'm going to um, kind of use a Foucauldian model. I, I don't want to I, I, I mean, I, I just think it's useful for laying out some characteristics of how we have conventionally thought about how surveillance operates in the register of governance, and then maybe for uh, looking at how things get reconfigured and how a model that you know may have been familiar to us uh, gets shifted. The um, uh, this is from Foucault's lectures on biopolitics, security, territory, population. That series of lectures, he's talking about control of uh, the territory. And what, what interests uh, uh, me here is um, obviously the, the um, relationship between the milieu and circulation. I tried to show you how the territorial sovereign became an architect of the discipline space, I'll say more about discipline in a second, but also and almost at the same time, the regulator of a milieu. So you've got these two things, you've got discipline and milieu. And I'm gonna say a couple, a, a little bit about each of those things. Um, regulating the milieu involved not so much establishing limits and frontiers as making possible guaranteeing and ensuring circulations, the circulation of people, merchandise, and air, et cetera. Very salient categories, right, for the, for the pandemic. All of those became key, uh, key issues. But it's, it's that notion of um, what it means to regulate the milieu. And what, what the, the claim I'm going to make is that milieu in this particular form formulation, and probably in ways that are familiar to us, refers to thinking about a collective or shared milieu. A milieu is something that is shared by a group or population, um, 
but there's a collective aspect to it. What I'm going to argue is that you see a kind of disarticulation uh, of the milieu, and that is an interesting um, development. Uh, so I, I did a related presentation to this a while back, and somebody said, you, you know, you say these things are interesting a lot, but, you know, what's your evaluation of them? When I say interesting, I mean, you know, subject of concern. <laughs> I think prob probably that's the translation. Um, uh, if, if, if we think about that opposition, uh, op opposition isn't the right word, sorry, like that spectrum from discipline uh, to population or, you know, from disciplinary space to, uh, to milieu, uh, Foucault lays it out in ways, some of which have been really popularized, right? So um, Panopticon has entered into kind of the contemporary media jargon. Uh, and interestingly, even Foucault scholars have used that notion of panopticism to describe um, the shift or, or the emerging shift towards kind of always on ubiquitous surveillance. I think that's a kind of um, misapplication of the term, and I'll, I'll say why in a second. But um, discipline, what, what, like for, uh, for our purposes, um, oh, I don't think this is the, uh, this, this is actually not the final revised slides, I think. But um, uh, anyway, I'll, uh, what, I, what I've added on to discipline or what I think is useful to think about is the way in which it's related to subjectification and internalization, right? So um, we know the standard panoptic model is you become the bearer of your own gaze, so like a familiar, uh, you, you become the bearer of the surveillance gaze, sorry. So the, the example of uh, um, the efficiency uh, from a utilitarian perspective of the panopticon is that you can actually have people behaving as if they're being monitored even when they not, might not be, right? You know, kind of trivial example, you walk into a store, it says, smile, you're on camera. There may not be any camera, but the notion that you could be being watched or that you might be being watched is meant to have a uh, disciplinary effect on you to the extent that you internalize um, uh, the imperatives that are associated with that gaze. Oh, I better behave. Um, uh, in, in Australia, when I moved back to Australia after a while, I'd forgotten that there are speed cameras everywhere. And um, uh, after I got a few automated tickets in the mail, I began to behave, uh, right? Like there's a, that's, that's kind of logics of subjectification, a kind of, kind of trivial example. Uh, but um, it, it relies on the symbolic power of the specter of surveillance, right? So Foucault says, um, for the panopticon, it is once too much and not enough to be watched all the time, right? It's too much because you don't need to watch people all the time as long as they know that they could be being watched. Uh, not enough is they have to know that knowledge has to be there and it has to be integrated. It has to be kind of subjectified, right? It has to be internalized. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you have forms of governance that operate at the level, at least in Foucault's understanding, that operate at the level of the population without necessarily partaking of the logic of subjectification um, and without necessarily being targeted towards particular individuals. Or uh, So it, it doesn't operate on um, uh, specific bodies in the way in which discipline operates. Uh, instead, it operates through transformations uh, in the milieu, in the environment. Uh, and I, the, the twist that, I'm, that interests me, that kind of pops out of the lectures on biopolitics, is that those footnotes envi on environmentality, which speak about a massive withdrawal from uh, the disciplinary model, and intervention in the rules of the game. What seems interesting to me about that is that it doesn't necessarily require the forms of subjectification or internalization that are associated with discipline. It also operates at the collective level, right? For Foucault, um, biopolitics takes incidents that might be aleatory is the word he used, you know, uh, at the individual level. You never know, let's, for example, if you make changes in the, um, I don't know, in the you know, public uh, health infrastructure in a city, you know that maybe overall rates of morbidity or mortality might shift, but you don't know specifically which individuals will shift, right? It's an, a, a kind of an actuarial calculation where regularities appear at the level of the population, even though at the level of the individual, they might be aleatory. Um, so what I want to do is think about what happens when the milieu becomes uh, recognitive and customizable, uh, and how that might shift logics of government. So in Foucault's framing, the milieu is the space that bears on all who live in it. So it has that kind of collective shared 
character. Um, these, this is, these are the thoughts about environmentality that intrigue me. Uh, so this is like the, the, um, uh, the footnote in the birth of biopolitics um, that, that doesn't get really developed. But, uh, and I've been tagged by some surveillance studies scholars who say to me, well, it's just a footnote. <laughs> you know, like, why are you spending so much time on it? Um, I, other people have, Jennifer Gabris has, Brian Masumi has. I, I think there's something interesting or productive there. He speaks about a massive withdrawal with regard to the normative disciplinary system. Why, what is, what is that? <laughs> uh, um, and it's not clear temporarily, uh, at least I, some of you may have better insight on this, you know, um, where he's locating that shift. Um, but what might it mean to to think about a withdrawal with regard to the normative disciplinary system. Um, uh, it, it might mean something along the lines of what happens if the symbolic power of uh, the spectacle of surveillance doesn't function the same way? What if, what if logics of um, subjectification and internalization um, come, uh, uh, you know, uh, not, don't operate in the way that's anticipated by disciplinary logics? Um, and uh, so one of the things that he suggests is that you, um, for forms of environmental governance, these modify the terms of the game, not the player's mentality. So that might be a way to think about um, that not the player's mentality, uh, that there's a certain um, perhaps non-necessariness of the forms of subjectification and internalization that are supposed that are associated with disciplinarity. What might it mean if you could govern by modifying environments in real time without necessarily intervening at the level of the of the uh, of the mental of the kind of symbolic message um, mentality of the subject? Uh, and so the the term that we've been developing and playing around with, I don't know if it's um, I don't know if it's uh, on its face uh, a, a worthwhile coinage, but I, it's all I've got for the moment, is thinking about a granular biopolitics, which means uh, operating at the level of the milieu as takes place in biopolitical forms of governance, but doing it at the scale of the individual. Um, uh, and in that sense, dispensing with the need for the forms of subjectification that take place at the, at the disciplinary level. Um, and what that means is, is twofold. From a disciplinary perspective, um, logics of subjectification and internalization might not be required. I'm not saying they're going away. I don't think that's gonna happen, but for certain registers of control, um, they might be displaced by um, thinking about how to intervene in the rules of the game. Uh, and the fate of the milieu is no longer collective or shared. This to me is a really interesting one. I think there's more going on here if you think about the, the fate of, of the milieu. And I'll, I'll say more about that uh, just uh, by way of conclusion. Um, so some symptoms of, of uh, you know, what, what we're thinking about or talking about is granular biopolitics. Um, and sorry, I'm making some big claims. This is meant to be a provocation and hopefully will generate some, some discussion. Um, one thing that's really interesting to me is the individualization of the calculation of probability. I, I was in a reading group that had some mathematicians who were doing work on trying to figure out what the individual level probability for non-repeatable event is. And I, I can't get my head around that because I always think about probability as operating across populations uh, uh, for repeatable events. But obviously the individualization of the calculation of risk would go with what we're thinking about as granular biopolitics. If you could disaggregate the population and take those things that were aleatory at the individual level and find ways to make them non-aleatory, you've kind of transformed the way to think about actuarial calculations. Um, the proliferation of biometric enclosures. I, um, this, I think, is something that we should probably be I, I, thinking about how to prepare for because I, I it, um, you know, all the indications that we've seen from the research that we're doing is that the increasing power of the technology combined with um, uh, the dropping price of it is, is going to make the implementation of um, smart cameras with facial recognition technology relatively ubiquitous. Um, one of the things that we've discovered is that companies that sell CCTV cameras to um, uh, commercial entities, municipal, municipalities, and so on, uh, they incorporate face recognition as a routine upgrade. So when you go to upgrade your CCTV system, that feature then becomes one of the, one of the features you can just check off for your next upgrade. Um, we already have in many locations, 
a quite um, comprehensive installed base of facial recognition technology. I'm sorry, of CCTV. Imagine if all that's upgraded to, to face recognition. Um, the shift from deterrence to preemption. I'll say something about that in, in a second, but deterrence Allow, relies on disciplinary logics, right? Um, the calculus is made by a subject um, that if they do this, some type of consequence will happen, and that operates as a form of deterrence. If deterrence doesn't operate, then you need preemption. Uh, but preemption requires a couple of things. It requires comprehensive monitoring, and I would argue increasingly it requires automated forms of response um, to stop somebody before they can do what they're planning to do. Um, the automated reconfiguration of the environment. This is the thing that I think it would be, I'd love to hear some examples or thoughts that you might have about this, but to watch out for. What are the ways in which we're seeing the environment itself that we move through being uh, equipped with the capability to automatically deform in response to particular individuals? Um, <clears throat> Obviously, augmented reality. Uh, the, you know, one of the things that I ask about technologies that keep failing, but that um, the tech sector won't give up on, is why they won't give up on it. Uh, and if you think about the metaverse, which keeps coming around, right? You know, Second Life, blah blah blah, metaverse uh, keeps failing, uh, and they're going to keep trying, and they're going to keep trying. I think precisely because it meets this. Um, imperative of the automated configuration of the environment, of the ability to govern through uh, granular forms of biopolitics. I, I think that's driving the interest, even though it keeps not working. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'll, sorry. Um, you know what, I, I, I'll, I'll just say very quickly, I, I, I was, I was interested when I made these claims about um, preemption, um, it's interesting to look at the forms of face recognition technology that are linked with forms of inferential um, uh, biometric or surveillance, which do things like predict behaviors based on things like mood, based on physical interaction, physical movements. The, the goal here is, I, I, um, I think these, I, I don't put a lot of credence in these claims, but I think the logic is worth keeping an eye on. Uh, Sentinel IQ, the only face recognition platform that proactively detects and deters threats as they enter the venue. These are for the sporting venues. Instantly delivering actionable intelligence to security personnel at, at the exact moment they need it. That's, you know, that's that kind of minority report logic. Um, there's another face recognition technology, WatchGuard, funded by Peter Thiel, uh, that sells software that can recognize specific behaviors like fighting, walking slowly when others are walking fast, blah, blah, blah. The software can detect that a fight is about to occur milliseconds after the first punch is launched before it lands on the victim. That's a really weird moment of tempor temporality, right? Like, if what does it mean to be able to identify that moment? I, the only reason I can think of to be able to identify that moment is to envision the possibility of intervening in that moment. And of course, for preemption, that moment is a crucial one. Where's, where have you crossed the border of certainty that's gonna happen, but not so far that you can't prevent it? That's, that's the weird temporality of, of preemption. Um, the, uh, so some big picture claims. Um, I, I think we're gonna keep seeing this promise of frictionless being deployed against the background of increasing forms of friction. Um, uh, the recession of the social, um, I, I, I kind of think of this along, these are really big sweeping speculative claims, but you know, this kind of contactlessness, touchlessness seems to, seems to um, uh, hypothesize a, a, a kind of self-contained hermetic individualism, which is also reinforced, I think, by um, informational enclosures, right? I'm going to see something different from what you see. Uh, one of the slides that, that I had in the updated version was um, these uh, automated cooler doors in Walgreens drugstores, where everybody goes in would see a different configuration of what's in the coolers based on inferences made about their face. They, they claim they're not using identification, they're just using age, uh, gender, and so on, which we know is quite vexed, but, to, uh, but also interest level, where your eyes go, what you look at. So behavioral indicators that can, that can change the, uh, your environment in real time. So your milieu will not necessarily be the same as the people that you're standing next to. Um, uh, <clears throat> another kind of random, uh, speculative observation around that form of disaggregation is think of what's happening in the informational world. All of the excitement around chat GP, uh, GPT, um, uh, around stable diffusion and these other image generators, what they're doing is generating 
basically tools that are able to customize the cultural and informational environment in real time. The only way you can do that at the individual level is through automated systems. You may have seen that BuzzFeed is now going to use chat GPT to generate quizzes. Did anybody see that? Right, like a different quiz for everybody. It could be. You no longer have to have the same quiz, the same newspaper, the same images. If you have this, um, if, if you're going to create these kind of um, customized milieus, uh, um, I, I've been talking about the physical form, but I think the informational form is interesting to, to talk about as well. Of course, none of this can function without automated systems. So uh, the ability to mass customize the milieu at the individual level requires automated real-time surveillance. Processing that in order to respond requires automated systems that are able to modify the environment in real time. So those are some implications, I think, of <clears throat> the impending widespread application of passive real-time forms of identification in shared space. Hopefully there's something interesting. Thanks for your time. I look forward to the discussion. Wow. You're all awake now, right? Um, Mark, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, it's uh, particularly interesting to me because I teach a course called The Digital State. And one of the exercises I have with my students is I ask them to draw the border on the body. Oh, wow. So I'm going to be taking away quite a lot of these uh, reflections, but perhaps most immediately, the thoughts about the ethics of inference that are implicit within these new forms of how an environment has changed for people individually as a result of this loss of the shared milieu. But fortunately, I am not a discussant on this panel, <laughs> and I'm going to hand over to Jack for the challenge of responding first, and then we'll just make our way down the line. And we have 40 minutes. Hello, can people hear me? David's online, okay, great. All right, uh, listening to uh, Mark is uh, always feels like uh, watching a locomotive, <laughs> <all right? laughs> moving uh, uh, fast. Off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, so, uh, uh, let me uh, try. To, uh, uh, there's so many ways to uh, engage in uh, uh, Mark's uh, sharing uh, last half hour. And uh, one of them could have been, okay, I'm, uh, you know, of course, when, when I look at the title, it could be the uh, uh, Borders Methods, right? The uh, Masadra and Nelson uh, book. Another one, since our we've been talking about James C. Scott the last couple of days. Okay, so that is uh, seen like a state. Okay, I think both this tag, there are lots of uh, intertextuality between those two books and uh, this talk. But I'm going to actually start from a different point. I'd like to take a, what, uh, probably an anarchist okay, uh, 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 engagement uh, point, uh, because I think uh, Mark has probably done this more, uh, much better more effectively and for longer time to analyze the problems of surveillance, capitalism, okay, and uh, different forms of uh, surveillance for uh, two or maybe three decades, right? And uh, uh, sometimes when we only focus, there's a, it's crucial that we analyze the problem, the di diagnosis, but at some point, you know, uh, uh, like, because I think for, uh, for, uh, Masatra and Nelson, and also for James C. Scott, their analysis also have, uh, in a way, while analyzing, they're also looking for solutions. So it's not, uh, they're also prescribing, uh, not, not maybe pre not precisely the solution, but approaches to find the solution. So I think the, in, in this sense, uh, I would say the most interesting, uh, uh, because uh, Mark said this is going to be a theoretical, okay, uh, not in, uh, above and beyond the very important cutting edge uh, empirical observations, the, the, the theoretical. I found the most pro, uh, it has to do with uh, 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 Foucault, but maybe even deeper, which is the circulation idea. Rachel talked about the body. So I'd like to start actually uh, using circulation as a, uh, as a point, which I got inspired by this talk to, uh, to um, uh, I think it's it's a it's a original idea when we talk about how societies and technologies of large scale can be organized. Okay, it's, it's about circulation. 
And uh, we need to think about circulation as also a place to find, uh, you know, prescriptions, especially because in COVID-19, uh, one of the, uh, I think, powerful, one of the most powerful uh, 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 way to talk about COVID-19 as a new starting point is uh, the late uh, Bruno Latour referred to COVID-19 as the uh, dress rehearsal. Okay, but when he wrote about this, it's, it's the dress rehearsal for a much darker future. There'll be other pandemics. There'll be other new surveillance regimes. But I'd like to, or, uh, given that I want to take a more anarchist all right, uh, critique, is that can we try? I think it's part of our intellectual mission is to try to find, maybe find the needle from the uh, haystack to a possible uh, dress rehearsals for something better. So um, uh, I want to start with, uh, because this theme is about Chinese societies, Singapore is 75% uh, Singapore, so uh, sorry, 75% Chinese. <laughs> and uh, um, I had uh, two chances of uh, interacting with, uh, one was a meeting with uh, Singapore GovTech, okay, the uh, government uh, 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 that oversees the contact tracing all over. They design the system, they have all the data. But then uh, the, the head of the, uh, the uh, GovTech was, uh, I was asking about how can you actually use this to analyze? This is everywhere, every Singaporean, myself, I'm a foreigner living in Singapore. Everyone would carry a token like this. I don't know how this is done in uh, 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 Australia. And then as a Bluetooth, Okay, and every time you, you it's contact, everywhere you go into your shopping mall, you have to wait, you have to scan it and go in and it will show whether your, your health status. So it's similar to the mainland China system that you showed, but, uh, but it's not in the mobile phone. It's a separate device. Right? And, um, and so every day, I, and when I look at my contact tracing app, I could see I, today I had 3,000 80, uh, 857 potential, okay, what you share. So uh, I can see this in my, in my phone. And there's so many data points, you know, like uh, what can you analyze it for? And then the, the, uh, the guy actually said, I have no idea. How can we, <laughs> Singapore, by the way, is a fraction of China, all right? We are China, Singapore is probably the smallest Chinese societies with its own, okay, uh, sovereignty, okay, uh, but, uh, and, uh, and uh, it's smaller than uh, Melbourne, all right? And uh, even though it's dense, probably, and, uh, and I, I, had, I got the same answer when I was talking to uh, my uh, colleague in the NTU uh, uh, public health, okay? Uh, how can you have any way to analyze this? So this, or in a way, uh, there's a presumption. We, we think the people who have the data or the biopolitical power knows what they will do with it after the tracing, maybe find out the dissidents or other, but what else can they do? And they don't even have any idea. And here is what, what I really love about uh, the circulation idea, because the, or the bio, the uh, uh, anatomy, okay, anatomy po uh, politics of the, the body comes in, is that there are some fundamental uh, imageries about these large scale systems. Okay, while we look at it from the bottom up, it's actually very different from top down. And the, uh, the circulation idea, first I would say, especially when we talk about modern technologies of, uh, of societal scale that have biopower, biopolitics. One uh, place to start is the body circulation of blood. Okay, that is the theory of uh, William Harvey, okay, in the 1600s. And according to, until this point, there's no full theory of the blood veins in the body, all right? And uh, after uh, William Harvey's circulation theory of blood vessels, that was, according to Armand Matelot, okay, the, a prototype for the French canal system, you know, uh, after Cardinal uh, Riselio, all right, who was, basically, this is a communication system. They study all the rivers in France and then connect it. And they're using the theory of blood circulation so that Paris would become the heart of the uh, bioanat. And the same thing was done, okay, in Soviet Union uh, under Stalin to make, okay, uh, 
Moscow the heart of circulation for the Soviet Union, you know, at the cost of millions of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 labor camp bodies, right? And, but then the, uh, the uh, uh, 200 years later, okay, uh, uh, roughly the same time when the Panopticon was still being built in England, Ireland, all right? And uh, we have the anarchist uh, rebuttal, okay? Most famously uh, by uh, 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 Proudhon, okay? His uh, 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 article about, about reforming the railway system. Okay, railway was the, uh, I, I probably am going too long, okay? <laughs> but basically the uh, railway was also built like the canal system with Paris as the center, London as the center, and then other places you go to less important towns, less important. But Proton was saying, this is completely wrong. Okay, we should reform the uh, railroad system as a checkerboard, checkerboard, okay? Like every different, every different boxes and Paris is one commune. And there, there are other communes, they're equally important. So we should not have the star shapes so that way is a different model of circulation that was behind much of the 19th, early, uh, 19th century, you know, uh, late 19th century, early uh, 20s, and even uh, to Cultural Revolution China. Right? And, the, uh, uh, and later on, this idea, of course, when on have these own ideas applied to not only transportation system, but also uh, rural industrialization from uh, Louis Montfort, okay, to Liang Suming, okay, in China. Right? So I think that uh, there's a different, I think uh, the circulation, how there, uh, I'm already going too long. I, I just think the, the massive data that we are now seeing being collected, uh, there, there might, uh, uh, by talking, I, I think I talked to some big brothers, okay, in Singapore, and uh, um, they are not so powerful to, you know, when Foucault talk about this uh, process of uh, uh, biopolitics, it takes generations, right? And I think there, there are, uh, I, 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 I think I just want to take this as an anarchist uh, response. You say uh, the same, uh, the, the massiveness, the, the fine grained data, okay, can have different possibilities. You know, uh, uh, at, at, uh, uh, COVID is indeed a dress rehearsal. But for what? That is still up to struggle. Thank you. And thanks, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jack, for bringing architecture back into the conversation about the milieu. Um, I've been reminded that we do, in fact, have an online discussion of this panel as well, who I'm going to invite to go next, if that's all right with you, Nicholas, because I don't know what time zone Dev is in. So if we could have Dev up on the screen. Dev, you've got about 10 minutes. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, good morning to everyone. I'm uh, joining from, from Thailand, where it's about 7 a.m. right now. Uh, but it's been a wonderful wake-up call, I think, uh, Mark's presentation to sort of, you know, to the, to the, the dangers and the risks of, of everything that we're seeing. And um, I think, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mark, for that, that wonderful presentation. And I think all of us who've been living through the pandemic for the last, you know, three years or so, We've all sort of felt this on a very visceral level uh, to see the, the sort of rise of infrastructure, uh, bioinfrastructure, collecting um, collecting our data, regulating our movement. But of course, for for you know, for many of us, we've been dealing with this gradual rise of infrastructure even before that. I think anyone who's applied for a visa, uh, for instance, Australia, I think one of the first countries to sort of introduce uh, biometrics collection uh, for for visa applications, and I think uh, you know this sort of trend uh, is is certainly rising. And, and as you say, what you find interesting is really means what you find concerning. <laughs> and I think uh, um, I definitely share those those share the those concerns. I think um, if I want to sort of focus my remarks uh, on a few points, um, I think one of the one of the maybe uh, points I'll share on is my own lived experience and sort of bringing this back to China. Um, you know, so I was living in China from 2016 until 2021. And so I got about a year and a half of the pandemic uh, living in Shanghai, but also sort of, you know, China had been moving towards introducing facial recognition pretty much everywhere uh, in the years preceding that. Um, I remember, uh, you know, when I was studying at Peking University, uh, you know, facial recognition came into the entry points into uh, the university as well. Um, 
starting from 2019. And, you know, you mentioned the F word, uh, Mark, about, you know, the frictions. And, and I think often it's like the stories that we tell ourselves about like why we need these certain technologies. And, and when I say the stories we tell ourselves, really it's the stories that are being told by, you know, certain, uh, whether it's, it's, it's certain powers that be, certain authorities or certain companies that are selling this technology. Um, and it's it's very clear that um, you know these stories of of facial recognition of these kinds of automation technologies will make our life easier. Uh, what exactly uh, you know this easier life will look like? Um, also, you know you you described that example of the VIP taking the elevator uh, and being dropped off only at his floor. Um, and I think a, another story along with the sort of F word is the China story, right? Uh, you know. Often, you know, you brought up a number of examples that of companies doing these uh, facial recognition applications from uh, presumably from from around, uh, whether it's Australia, the US or, or Europe. And, you know, so much of our global conversation and discourse gets centered on China as being the sort of the this, this surveillance capital, the authoritarian that is sort of uh, introducing facial recognition and, and ADMS technologies at an at unprecedented scale. And on, and on one point, that's true. Uh, there is a sort of widespread experimentation of these technologies, but at the hand, on the other hand, it's so global. Yet our sort of stories about China sort of tend to obscure this fact and and sort of turn attention away uh, from ourselves and from away what from what our own countries and from what other parts of the world may be doing. And I think that's uh, you know that's certainly something that uh, I, I observe as well. You know, looking at the, the social credit system and and some of the stories and the myths and the fictions. Uh, that circulated around the system over the last uh, three or four years, um, especially around surveillance and, and what governments uh, can and should be doing. Um, I think uh, a point I wanted to share was also about finally, like where, uh, you know, what's the value in this, this heightened biosecurity, right? I think Bruce Schneier in his book, uh, The D Data Goliaths, um, he talked about, you know, post 9-11 of how 9-11 created this catalyst for, uh, you know, heightened uh, security theater and surveillance, uh, certainly in the United States. And then eventually that trend has become global. Uh, you know, today, if you enter a, 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 a hotel, for instance, in, in India or certainly in Bombay, you have to do, uh, you know, a very intense airport style x-ray security uh, of your you know your devices and of course your person and that's now just the norm both in hotels and in in shopping malls as well um i found that to be the case also in in jakarta in indonesia and i think you know you talked about uh the the sort of physical spaces and the virtual spaces uh, sort of the, the surveillance technologies coming together and how our spaces are, are consistently being shaped by this and I think that that trend was, you know, already visible there with, you know, with that kind of security security architecture. Um, and now with uh, the facial recognition surveillance, you know, we're seeing that, um, uh, you know, that the rise in that infrastructure and, and you know, those the, whether it's the cameras, whether it's, you know, other um, other technologies that are sort of bringing that in. And, you know, ultimately, it seems to me, it seems pretty clear that, you know, if 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 a pand if the, if a new pandemic were to arise or you know we or this pandemic were to evolve into a, an even darker direction you know i think jack talked about the singapore government you know offering these uh, smart bracelets uh, you know for uh, for monitoring um, and i i mean it and it's you know it's not that far fetched to see a world in which uh, we have various authorities whether it's companies or governments you know offering these uh, uh, bracelets that uh, can monitor someone's someone's uh, uh, body and, and their body temperature and, and other data points. Because ultimately, and, and this goes back to, I think, uh, some of the, the presentations from, uh, I, I think even uh, Daishin and his keynote on, on Wednesday and, and some of the presentations yesterday, which is that the answer, when the, when the answer fails, the, you know, whether I think Daishin put the health code in his matrix of uh, high noise and, and, you know, low value. And I think, when when if, they, if that's the if that becomes the outcome, the answer tends to be is you know we need to collect more data. We need to collect better data, uh, and rather than we need to question whether a health code is actually uh, you know taking us into the direction uh, that uh, that that we as people as a society want. Uh, 
And I think uh, you know that trend uh, certainly seems to be seems to be seems to be continuing. And and you know even with new emerging technologies, uh, like for instance with you know with blockchain technologies, I think even though the, uh, it it comes from a, a place of um, uh, hyper individualization, uh, individualization and and you know personal control uh, to see how blockchain technologies could also be appropriated uh, towards again uh, uh, taking away authority from the individual and 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 automating that such that you know when you enter these these milieus these new spaces that you talk about mark you not only bring your current uh you know face and your body with you but you're bringing a whole sort of baggage and a body of of your data your who you are as a person uh your preferences your choices and you know you can then create this individual this hyper individualized space almost where you're, what you're being sold, what messaging you're seeing, as you talked about, you know, chat GPT style newspapers that are hyper individualized, is you have this um, uh, hyper individualization alongside a hyper centralization, because who is deciding what information is being presented to each individual is ultimately in the hands of a very small cabal of people. And so this trend of of new technologies being first decentral decentralized and moving towards centralization uh, I think what uh, uh, Tim Wu often talked about in his book, Information Cycles, tends to be, I think, relevant here as well. Um, yeah, I think I think there's there's so many interesting points, and Mark, I'm so glad that you are putting uh, this work into it because I think it's so relevant for all of our sort of essential lives and futures to, to better understand and foresee these trends. So that I think for the for the start, you know, we as people can first start seeing the stories that are being told to us uh, and better identify them. Uh, better uh, question them, and then perhaps uh, we can tell you know newer stories that you know go beyond the the F word, uh, you know go beyond uh, try trying to make life as frictionless as possible, and where you know frictions may actually be desirable, uh, you know because frictions sometimes allow people to a, a, a chance to pause, a chance to introspect, or even a chance to sort of rethink their decisions. And you know what would a, a world that's completely frictionless look like? I'm not sure that that's the world that you know we necessarily uh, really want to have contended with and uh, and and truly want to live in. Um, so uh, thank you so much, and I'll I, I'll continue sort of following on the 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 other comments from the discussions and and for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Dev, I'm not sure where to look, but thank you ever so much <laughs> for those comments. It's really fantastic to have someone who's able to take some of the online ethnography of corporate spaces and their narratives that um, Mark was just talking about and ground it in specific cities, times, and places. Hand over to you now, Nick. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you guys hear me? All right. Yeah. I would also just uh, like to say thank you very much. It was a really thought provoking talk. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a kind of talk that I, it, it, it feels right for me. I mean, I'm kind of professionally cynical. And so <laughs> I, you know, hearing this kind of talk, you can just like lean into it with all these examples. And um, so what I wanted to do with my comments is actually try to go against my natural instincts and think about perhaps different ways of, of thinking about this, uh, just kind of open questions maybe, but I, I would start with a personal experience I just had because if we're thinking about friction, uh, when I was coming to Australia, I was suddenly um, encountered dramatic friction because I didn't know that I needed to get this ETA thing. So I arrive at the airport with my British passport and I say, all right, I'm going to Australia now. And they're like, where's your visa? And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> the king said I could come. I mean, <laughs> don't you know who I am? And suddenly, you know, to be confronted with this, this friction, and I didn't know if I was actually going to make it on the plane. In the end, I rapidly entered all my details, took a photo of myself through this Australian uh, border control app, and with two minutes before the gate closed, I managed to get through. Um, but I think when we're thinking about friction versus frictionlessness, there, throughout history, and if we're thinking about longer term histories of borders, there have it been at different times, different levels of friction for different groups of people, right? And I mean, we can think about that with longer legacies of Chinese exclusion in the US and Australia, where at some points, 
it becomes quite easy to move into spaces and become established, and then it becomes almost impossible. Um, but I think what this, for me, it begs the question, um, because when we're, we're thinking about these new technologies and how they become very granular, uh, as, you're, as you're pointing out, we also have this almost assumption of inevitability, an assumption of permanence, I would say. Like, we're, we're moving towards this future where there will be inherently these types of technologies that will be able to control us. And I also feel in that, I feel kind of intuitively that's where we're, we're headed. But I wonder if maybe we're misreading this somehow, if we look back at the history and see how we fluctuate between moments of hard control that is imposed from above through different modes of and technologies of surveillance at different periods in history. Um, and are we just seeing, you know, seeing a trajectory that we think is inevitable, but perhaps isn't necessarily inevitable, at least not in the ways that we think it is. Um, and on that point, I just wanted to, you know, through this conference, there's one uh, thinker that I that I hasn't been mentioned that I think probably should be mentioned, uh, Benjamin Bratton. Uh, his work on the stack, I think, is is really relevant to a lot of the stuff that people have been talking about. And his uh, recent, his pandemic book, The Revenge of the Real, I don't know if, if, if people here have read this. Um, it's a really interesting book, I think. And the argument that he makes in, in this is essentially these technologies are inevitable, but perhaps we need to start thinking about a positive biopolitics. Is a positive biopolitics possible with these emerging surveillance technologies? Um, is it possible that surveillance can be shifted from something that's being done to us to something that we're doing together? Um, and I don't have an answer for that, but I think it's an interesting question that we should ask. I mean, is because whenever we talk about biopolitics, there it's ominous, right? But the pandemic showed, if anything, that you need to have some form of biopolitics to collectively keep people alive, right? I mean, that, that's what biopolitics is about. It's also about the health, the collective health of, of society. So um, yeah, I guess the big question I would have is, um, is it possible within this framework that we have at the moment, is there an alternate future perhaps? It's not an anarchist future, uh, but is there an alternate future that is, uh, where these technologies are actually marshaled for collective being together, uh, or is that completely um, just wishful thinking? Yeah, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. From technological determinism to fantasy optimism. <laughs> uh, let's finish up with Roger. Oh dear. Um... I'm, um, I would be lying if I said I didn't feel a need to out cynic uh, Nicholas here. Uh, I want to talk about um, a couple of elements that I uh, picked out of Mark's uh, excellent uh, review. Um, and they are history, scale, materiality, and promises. And the thing is, you know, much of what we experienced now in regard to the pandemic, we experienced for the first time. It was a once in a century pandemic. The previous one was 102 years ago. So we were due one. Um, but it's, it was also a once in a century pandemic. And there have been multiple centuries. And when you look at the way that human society is organized, uh, avoiding, uh, avoiding infectious disease has been one of the driving forces in the way that societies organize themselves. The word quarantine originally uh, referred to the practice of putting a ship with disease on it outside of a port for 40 days. Quite a crude measure, right? But what is the difference between that sailing ship that would be put outside of a port for 40 days, uh, you know, in the days of the Black Death? And today, the difference is one of scale. And I think we have to bring in scale and the material world in our discussions before, uh, in order to make sense of the things that we like to talk about, which is the mental or symbolic world, you know, the words, the narratives, the ideas, the beliefs. Purely materially speaking, just the last couple of decades have seen 
an exponential, almost black and white shift in global mobility of goods and people. We used to joke in my family uh, that my grandmother had the Germans not occupied Belgium in the Second World War, my grandmother would have never been in a different country. And that was a very normal situation. You know, you just didn't leave your country. Whereas now we have flown in into a country that, you know, when my grandmother was my age, would have taken a week or two to reach by ship because intercontinental air travel was in its infancy. We have flown in here. Some people have literally flown in uh, into the airport straight to here to give their presentations, probably with steady jet lag. You know, if that isn't friction frictionless in comparison, I don't know what is. Um, but we expect this system somehow to work, right? Rather than a system whereby there's a ship that rocks up in Melbourne Harbor and Sydney Harbor every other week, bringing a bunch of 10 pound bombs, we are now dealing with a system in which airports all across this country have to process thousands of travelers on a daily basis. And scale matters, you know, you can, uh, scale matters in the sense that try, you know, try to drown in a drop of water. It's rather easier to, um, to drown in an ocean of water. And the properties of water itself don't change, but scale comes with emergent properties. What that means in order for scale to function is that we must have frictionlessness. The very system demands it, right? And think about all of these systems that we rely upon. Um, we all flew in here on some of the most complex machines that humanity has ever built, operated by a pyramid of hundreds of thousands of pilots and baggage loaders and air traffic controllers and mechanics, also that who all have to comply with the imperatives of the machine, who you know who must work in a zero creativity environment. The last thing you'd want an airline pilot to do is get creative who must work in a non-creative environment where they must obey the imperatives of the system in order for us to be here and discuss Foucault. We sometimes forget that. We also forget about supermarkets. You know, Isn't it a miracle of our age that we can walk into any supermarket on any corner of the street? There's a cornucopia of thousands of products that is there and we get pissed off when they're not there. Uh, remember the toilet paper at the beginning of the pandemic, which we could talk about in the coffee break is also a very interesting example of system effects. Um, automation is part of the force multipliers for human capabilities, which makes that possible in the same way that the steam engine was a force multiplier for human muscle, right? If we want these frictionless systems to exist, if we want to be able to fly to Melbourne collectively to talk about Foucault, then we must tolerate at the very least these systems because otherwise it is impossible. And maybe it is the case that human beings, you know, the things that human beings want tend to be not good for them. And I certainly struggle with that choice when faced with either a chocolate brownie or a fruit salad. Um, may, but maybe this is a problem in general where we crave convenience because we evolved in an environment where convenience was absent. We crave the chocolate brownie because we evolved in an, in an environment where uh, sugar and fat were extremely hard to come by. But we have experienced a paradigm shift, and I think we're also experiencing a paradigm shift in information, which we must, I believe, take far more seriously than we do. And I'm saying this from the perspective of someone who did a PhD as a copyright lawyer. Copyright is a response to scarcity. It is an incentive device to alter the cost-benefit analysis of creating and distributing information which at the point in time when it was invented, you know, creating information was extremely expensive. And those of you who went to university in the year 2000 or before will also remember how extremely tricky it was just to get information. You know, library index cards and books aren't easily searchable. Now we are in a situation where the information environment isn't scarce, it is abundant. And abundance comes with different rules. No longer is the creation of information the problem. It is the sorting of information. TikTok is one of the most valuable media companies in the world, not because it creates content, it outsources that to a whole bunch of teenagers, but because it manages to present that content in a way that its audiences like and that 
TikTok therefore can monetize. Um, what does that mean? It means that a lot of the norms and the values that we have come to associate with media must be reconstructed in the, in the light of this new material paradigm. For instance, no longer can we say in the free speech debate that the, but that the best solution to bad speech is more speech because the amount of speech out there is already functionally infinite. What is it? Every second, 8,000 seconds of content are added to TikTok. And that's even before we start talking about YouTube. In other words, what we are faced with is no longer the fact that we somehow need to incentivize or manage the creation of content. You know, uh, smartphones have, told, have turned us into the million proverbial monkeys with the, with the million typewriters. But, we, but the question of sorting and presentation, and prioritization, and we have very little if no language for it. Also because we've somehow conned ourselves into believing that history no longer applies because we are somehow special. Um, what that also means is that a lot of the, we were talking about advertising and automated advertising, and that has to sort of be part of it, you know, that, that, but that then becomes part of a story that internet companies sell pretty much have been sort of trying to sell even before the internet. Uh, there's a really good book, If Then, by Jill Lepore, which talks about the Simulmatics Corporation, which really launched this idea that you can have data-enabled um, delivery of information, either, through, either for marketing purposes or for electoral purposes. So that idea has, has sort of kind of been there um, for uh, before we got the internet. The internet turbocharges it. So the promise of a company like Facebook to advertisers is that, you know, you put your ad in a newspaper, it's, you know, it's like a dumb bomb and you need to throw a lot of dumb bombs to hit the factory. Whereas we promise that your advertising becomes a smart bomb where you can much more accurately target the specific person you want to fork out money for your product or to vote for your candidate. The jury is out to the extent of whether that promise is true. And we've all had the experience of buying something on any e-commerce website and then seeing it in our, advert uh, in our advertisements uh, you know, for the next week running. You know, do you want to buy this jumper? No, I have already got one. Thank you very much. So, you know, uh, but it is an interesting story. It is an interesting narrative for people who essentially, because people are stupid, uh, and people are stupid storytelling monkeys, not rational utility maximizers. Um, you know, stupid gullible monkeys want to believe that the, that the silver bullet exists. And that is what fueled things like the marketization, the market caps of Facebook. The problem with that we're seeing now is that friction is reintroducing itself. Uh, interest rates are going up. Uh, and suddenly these companies stock valuations are tanking because now the, pro the, the, the promises are be actually being held to market discipline, which is very interesting. Can it work? I, I don't think so, frankly. I think human reality is messy. We cannot have automated driving in cities because people jaywalk. Environment matters. You can, you can automate driving on the highway far more easily because it's a constrained environment with much more specific rules and much fewer variables. But turns out that city life is different. To conclude, what we therefore need is new language, particularly in the academy. Much of our discussions tend to be about atomized individuals in relationships to large collectives, usually the state, sometimes large com companies. But we need far more of a te theory of what, ha what happens in the middle. And the reason for that is that change materiality. I grew up in a small town where there were about 40 or 50 people my age. That forced me to be tolerant because if I couldn't get along with people who thought differently from me, I wouldn't have any friends. The internet makes it possible to create communities of choice, which actually leads to a growth of political intolerance because no longer are you forced to be tolerant in a geographically bounded space. These kinds of collectives have emergent properties, which, are, which I think we have severely understudied, at least in relation to these discussions. So let us develop a language which isn't just about the, the individual versus the machine, but that thinks through scale, environment, and paradigm in human systems in a historicized manner, um, that would, I believe, lead to far more um, rich, to richer discussion. Thank you. All right, our discussants have taken us to Jakarta, Paris, Stockholm, 
Beijing. They've taken us through their pessimistic responses and their optimistic collectivist ones. And we're thinking about the gaze in the personally modified milieu, but I would like to give Mark the remaining three minutes <laughs> of our slot together. If you would like to respond uh, to any particular part of the discussion commentary, because we don't have a break until lunch. Oh, Three thank minutes. you. Well, I, I, huge thanks to the. the All oh, right, we okay. started late, so you get more than three minutes, Mark. <laughs> I'm going to need more than three minutes, but <laughs> um, I probably I feel bad taking it. That's um, what we want to hear. <laughs> uh, I, I, huge thanks to um, the respondents for um, their super generative uh, and quite wide spectrum of of responses. Um, it's. I, it's hard to know where to begin. I I, I really I, I thought Jack's um, Jack's story about Singapore speaking to the official and saying like we've got all this data we don't know what to do with it. Um, it, it reminds me a lot of what happened uh, in in the rise of the surveillance systems in the post 9/11 era in the U.S. You may have seen the Wall Street Journal did a big report on it. I can't remember when it was, maybe 2005 or six, where they went to try to track down all of the different surveillance systems in the US that were being mobilized for security purposes. And there was nobody who, who had any kind of overview of this. And most of them didn't know what the others were doing. It was that, that same problem, huge amounts of data um, being collected, but with a kind of absent sense-making process. Um, and uh, th that gets, I, I guess, the um, uh, Roger's uh, discussion of scale. Um, uh, here are a couple of things to say about that, I suppose. One is, we know where that's headed. It's quite obvious. <laughs> it's that the scale of the data that's being collected has surpassed the sense-making capacity. Um, the, um, uh, one of the things that I'm interested in doing that I, I think aligns with um, kind of Jack's sympathies, I hope, <laughs> is, is to attempt to push the logics that I see at work to the extremes that are so absurd that they implode, right? Like that's in, in a sense, the rhetorical strategy. I'm often accused of, of, um, of taking like really extreme absurd examples. Like that's not possible, that's not gonna happen. Um, I have a twofold response to that. One is when I gave those examples 20 years ago, uh, and people said that a lot of those things did happen. So that's the alarming side for me. I mean, like I've got enough of a track record to go. Uh, I remember being told that. <laughs> and actually these things did happen. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I, I guess um, the second response is um, even those things that did happen remain absurd. <laughs> and uh, and the, the, the underlying logics remain absurd to my mind. Um, but absurd is a weird word. Like, wh what do I mean by that? I, I suppose in some sense, I mean that they are, from my perspective, incomprehensible and impossible. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are inherently so, but it means it would mean obliterating my type of world and perspective <laughs> to make them operate. But so I, 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 taken to the limit, would total surveillance lead to a total law-abiding society? Right. Um, if it were possible, yes, I suppose. Right. Like that's the underlying logic, right? Where we're headed. Um, frictionlessness, securitization, circulation. If you could perfect it, it would be perfect. Right. The point is to is to implode the notion that you could perfect it. Right. That's 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 the work that gets done. Um, but if you were able to implode that, then then what? Right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the the, uh, the the practical on the ground answer is we know what's going to happen. Um, automated systems are going to be used to make sense of these technologies. We also know what's going to happen is they're going to they're not going to be perfect. Um, but decisions will be made on that basis, uh, and in some sense they'll be made on that basis by default because there is no other way. Either you reject the information or you subject it to automated um, systems that are going to get it wrong, right? Um, rejecting the information is, that's an interesting way to go. I don't think it's gonna happen. I have certain tendencies in that direction. I kind of, you know, I, I like Jack's 
discussion of circulation, I think it's really interesting. I was thinking about when he was talking about it, the collapse of the airlines in the US. Do you remember this? You know, it was Southwest was the one that was messed up for two weeks because everybody else had a hub and spoke model and Southwest had a point to point model. And when things broke down, the point to point model wouldn't work. Like it just won't work for that um, scale and pace of circulation, which means what's the alternative? Maybe we don't need that pace or scale. I, I like I have that sympathy, um, but I, 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 maybe those aren't the only two choices. And I have a conversation with Jack <laughs> about that. Um, the uh, um, the uh, Roger's remarks about um, about uh, a kind of um, frictionlessness. We want frictionlessness. We need frictionlessness. Um, I, I like to rub that up against Dev's comment of maybe we need friction. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's not, I, I, when Roger used the, the very familiar military language for advertising, um, it, it, it really aligns with some of the ways that I've been thinking about, you know, like, um, you know, smart bombs and versus dumb bombs. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think that's purely accidental as a, as a rhetorical strategy in the advertising world. There is a death drive behind um, this, uh, logic uh, and pace of acceleration. Friction, we know what friction is. Friction is us. <laughs> like that's, um, you, you know, if you really want these systems to like, what if, what if you want a perfected self-driving car system, a perfected securitization of circulation? What you need is the, you know, end, nth reduction of friction. And we know what that is. That's going to be whatever it is that we think of as our idiosyncratic forms of human agency and resistance, right? Those are, those are gonna be the friction points. Um, uh, um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I'm kind of going off in random directions, but um, the, uh, there's a certain affinity with a post-human um, desire, right? Which, which would actually perhaps reduce that form of friction to the point that we would no longer endow ourselves with whatever it is we think of those capacities um, that are different from uh, a, a certain material artifacts. If we could reach that point, then perhaps that form of frictionless would be more obtainable <laughs> in, in certain ways. Um, it's, it's a desire I don't, I don't quite understand, but it seems um, generalized. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't, I, I, I guess I, 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 I'm not sure I've got, um, uh, my, oh, I, sorry, the, the last point also speaking to Roger that, that I would make, I like the idea of the language of the intermediate language. I would couch it probably not as intermediate in scale, but as the language of the social. We know the critical work that gets done all the time in these automated systems that get it wrong is to say, these systems are irreducibly social. They keep trying to reach the escape velocity where they're no longer, but we haven't reached that point. Um, has anybody see if you've seen Google's selfish ledger, right? It kind of envisions this escape velocity, right? Like um, we provide enough data to the ledger that the ledger kind of incorporates our imperatives, but then it gets good enough to create its own imperatives and kind of um, organize us according to imperatives that are better than those uh, that, that we would come up. It, it has a, it's a fantasy of the post-social. Um, the critical work that often gets done around automated systems is where can we find, where can, we, where can it come to ground on the social? Here is where the data actually reflects social relations. Here is where the conditions of production of the algorithm is in, deeply embedded in social relations. It's always a language of retrieving the social against the tendency to, um, for automated systems to kind of reach a, reach a kind of notional escape velocity from, from the social. I, I, I think that critical move is all we've got at the moment. So uh, I, um, one of the things that, I, that, that alarm me about these systems is the way in which they seem to foment what I've been describing as a kind of recession of the social. These are social decisions that embed social imperatives, um, but they do it in ways where those become increasingly non-transparent to us. Um, and all we see is our own motivations and those interactions with automated systems that capture them, reflect them, deflect them, channel them. But what we, what we what's harder to see in some ways is the embeddedness in, in social relations. Is it impossible that, that some type of escape velocity gets reached? 
not necessarily, I don't think, but it would be deeply dystopian. We would end up with a kind of endless repetition, but um, which to me would align with this kind of death drive. You'd get a kind of extinction of, of whatever it is that's um, um, you know, human about friction. I don't know, sorry, that's what I got. We humans are indeed the friction. Um, friction and desire, they go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. they are. So my <laughs> understanding hand. is that, this, that <laughs> this work already exists as an article. Sorry? So my understanding is this work already exists as an article. Mm, pieces of it pieces do. Pieces of it. Well, as, uh, uh, there's an article in preparation mm -hmm. that's gone so through, my, through so many revisions that um, um, I hope it'll make light of day. It's called Granular Biopolitics. Yeah. Um, if you want a copy, email me. I'll send it to you. I imagine it's not yet published. The opportunity to sit down and read through these ideas at our own pace would be extremely welcome. Um, and I'm sure we'll all look forward to the other work that's going to come out of this project from you and, and your colleagues. Um, but what the presentation and discussions have done so far is lay the ground perfectly for panel eight which is surveillance in everyday life, where I'm sure we're going to encounter some more frictions. We're going to be seeing discourse, rhetoric, workarounds, imaginaries that come out of the Chinese context. But before we go on to our next panel, I'd like to ask everybody to thank Mark and our panelists again for such a wonderful kickoff to day three.